If you really want to understand the rape and slaughter being committed in the name of Allah by the Islamic State, you have to study the history of Muhammad and his companions, a history found in the Hadith and the Sira literature. But you can get a pretty good outline of the Islamic State's message and tactics by reading the Quran, which Muslims believe to be the direct word of Allah. For those of you who don't have time to read the Quran, here's a top 10 list of the most essential verses for understanding ISIS. Oh man, this David Wood guy seems so intelligent. He has like 200,000 subscribers. And he has that anime character Saitama as his channel profile. I mean, <laughs> there's no way he's some diagnosed psychopath or something. I decided uh, to kill my dad. And I decided to do it in a brutal fashion, not a, not a gunshot or anything. I was going to do it with a hammer. When I walked up to my dad, I've got a, I had a hammer in my hand, and I hit him in the head seven or eight times with a ball-peen hammer until I thought he was dead, and uh, I just left. Now, let's see. Let's see what he has to say. When Muhammad was completely outnumbered, he had to put up with idolaters. But once he had the most powerful army in Arabia, the message of Islam became convert or die. Surah 9 verse 5 contains Allah's final marching orders on dealing with idolaters. When the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captive, and besiege them, and prepare for them each ambush. But if they repent, and establish worship, and pay the poor due, then leave their way free. Lo, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So kill them unless they convert to Islam. Sound familiar? Oh man, this guy is so smart. I mean, for the Muslims, there's no way out of this, you know? So, let me just check this verse for a quick second. Alright, here we go. Oh man, those stupid Muslims are so done. Okay, so here it says, And when the sacred months have passed, then kill the polytheist wherever you find them. Man, Islam is such barbaric religion. They're telling people to kill all polytheists wherever you find them. Hmm, let me just check what the next verse says. Would you not fight a people who broke their oath and determined to expel the messenger and they had begun the attack upon you the first time? Wait, what? This first is saying that the, these other guys were the ones who attacked first. Hang on a second, I thought the Muslims were the one who started everything. Hang on, let me, let me check the commentary on this. Here we have a commentary by Ustaz Paraz Ali Khan who says that on the verse 9-5 it says the verse of the sword deals specifically with the situation of Meccan polytheists breaking peace treaties. Wait, this is just talking about the Meccan polytheists? Who are breaking peace treaties and openly declaring war on the Muslim polity. The verse then commands the Muslim state to take up arms and defend itself against those that breached their covenant and attacked out of treachery. Wait, what? I thought I thought the Muslims were attacking just non-believers. Here it's saying that actually the, it's the, the polytheists who attacked first. Wait a minute. Then we have another commentary that says that says every verse of the Quran must be read and interpreted against the background of the Quran as a whole. Wait, I thought I thought you could just read a verse of the Quran and, and just understand whatever you want from it. Wait a minute. What? No. Here we have another commentary by Professor Jamal A. Badwi who says verse 9-5 has nothing to do with the people of the book, Jews or Christian, who are distinguished from other non-believers. The Quran text 9-8 to 98.981 98 makes a clear distinction between the people of the book 
or Ahlul Kitab and the idolatrous people or Al Mushrikeen, the term used in 95. So it's not talking about Jews and Christians. So only the, the polytheists that attack the Muslims first? No. No, that can be. But, 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 David Wood, why? No. No. Hello everyone, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, welcome back. Sorry about the long intro, I detest this guy. He's probably one of the most worst Islamophobes out there and I've been meaning to make a video about him for a very long time. Uh, although my depiction of an Islamophobe or an ex-Muslim is probably not very accurate, I mean, let's be honest, Islamophobes are not that smart. <laughs> I mean, I wish they were this smart to put things together like this, but uh, they clearly aren't. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be Islamophobes. Uh, so, as you probably guessed, on this episode, we will cover a very, very, very famous topic and a very famous error in reasoning that Islamophobes love to make. And that is, it's the cherry picking fallacy. Uh, so, basically, what this fallacy is, is that when only select evidence is presented in order to persuade the audience to accept a position and evidence that would go against the position is withheld basically what this is is that uh, say that there's a book and in that book there is one sentence and you take that one sentence say that look uh, this book is saying this you know then you pick another sentence that agree with your view and say that look this sentence is saying this therefore this book is this so basically when you take out information that suits your agenda and ignore information that doesn't suit your agenda that is basically what is known as the cherry picking fallacy uh, just like David Wood did uh, in, in the intro of this video so basically he took a uh, verse of the Quran that agree with his view that you know Islam is violent because he's trying to show his audience that Islam is violent so what he's doing is that he's only cherry picking only picking the verses that seems violent and ignoring the verses that are peaceful uh, he's showing these verses out of context I mean he's not reading the verse before or after which contradicts his view and to show the audience that look uh, the Quran is violent basically he's brainwashing his audience He's cherry picking uh, uh, verses in the Quran out of context and, uh, sh and just showing it to the audience. And if you w watch his whole video, this is all he does. <laughs> you know, I mean, his whole video is about this. Now, let's talk about the verse, uh, uh, ch chapter number 9, uh, verse 5. You know, the sword verse. There is a verse in the Quran which says but no by your lord they can have no faith until they make you o muhammad judge in all disputes between them and find themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission this is in surah nisa chapter number four verse number 65 now there is another verse that says something similar uh, the messenger of God is certainly a good example for those of you who have hope in God and in the day of judgment and who remember God very often. This is in chapter number 33, verse number 21. Well, you may be wondering what does this mean? Well, it simply means that when we have a difference of opinion, according to Allah SWT, we have to look to the Prophet and see what he told us to do and follow that. How do we do that? Well, by looking at his life, which means the Hadith or the Seerah or the Tafsir. Allah SWT also says the Prophet is a good example, which means we have to follow his example. We have to obey the word of Allah SWT the way he obeyed it. Uh, and we have to follow his example. So if we follow his example with regard to verse uh, chapter number five, 9, verse number 5, what do we see? Do we see the Prophet killing non-Muslims indiscriminately? 
No. What we see is that this was revealed in a time of war, when Muslims had peace treaty with various different pagan tribes of Arabia, especially the Meccans. The treaty stated that the Meccan pagan Arabs cannot attack Medina uh, and their allies, and Medina cannot attack the pagans as well. Now, according to Sheikh Muhammad Tahir al Qudri, who is an Islamic scholar, certain tribes broke this treaty and become very hostile. One of these tribes were Banu Bakr, who were allies to the pagans, uh, the pagans of Mecca. They attacked one of the allies of Medina called Banu Khuza, you know, the allies of the Muslims. Uh, they pretty much massacred them and the, the Meccans provided them arms and weapons and they also participated in the killing as well. This is a clear act of war and then these verses were revealed. However, even then Allah SWT gave them four months to repent or leave. I mean, just imagine that for a second. I mean, you have a peace history between two nations and one of the nations break the treaty and completely massacres one of your villages of the other country. And the leader of the country gives them four months to make things right. That's completely unheard of. Okay, I mean, no country would do that. I mean, it, it would be the start of, of a war uh, immediately. But here we see that Allah SWT actually gave them four months. And this verse is talking about these tribes who bro broke the tree. This becomes even clearer when we read verse uh, 9, 9 4, a verse before that, before this verse, which reads In exception to those who associ associate others with Allah in His divinity, are those with whom you have made treaties and who have not violated these treaties nor have backed up anyone against you. Fulfill your treaties with them until the end of their term. Surely Allah loves the pious. Again, in uh, chapter 9, verse number 4. Which means that this verse only applies to those who broke the treaty, you know, broke the peace treaty. As for the tribes who were allies to the Meccans, but they did not break their treaty with the Medina, will not be harmed. And this verse will not apply to them. Also, even during the war, if some non-combatant comes to the Muslims seeking refuge, the Muslims are under an obligation to provide them security and safety. Uh, for that, a civilian or non-combatant, according to verse uh, 9-6, you know, the verse after that, which reads, And if any one of the polytheists seeks, prote seeks your protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the word of Allah. Then deliver him to his place of safety. That is because they are a people who do not know. This means Muslims are obligated to help the refugees who come seeking help, safety and protection during times of jihad. Now just imagine that for a second. You know, you hear all this nonsense about refugees and immigrants. Here, the Quran makes it clear, if you are if you're at war with another nation, then whatever damage you cause to the other nation, if uh, some people of that other nation come seeking your help, you know, since you kind of destroy their home, you have to give it to them, you know. I mean, I mean, what, no country does that, you know. I mean, the, the, the Quran is actually showing you how to do politics you know how to take care i mean it, it's t actually teaching you to be responsible because uh, people don't do that i mean look at america like they're they want to build a wall and yet most of the cases uh you see like the war in iraq or afghanistan the violence was unwarranted and it was you know many of the people who are fleeing middle east lost their homes because of airstrikes that was oftentimes done by the European countries or the Western countries yet they don't want to take responsibility for this but here we have in the Quran Muslims are obligated to help uh, the refugees of war you know because you know it's their responsibility because they destroy their homes or uh, their country they have to take them uh, into the country this uh, comes seeking their help so, which is which I found quite amazing, and this shows that the Quran is really ahead of its time, you know, because uh, even now people don't behave like this when it comes to war, even even now. So, it seems like uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala 
obviously this this is why Quran is a guidance to mankind even now but anyway this means the Muslims are obligated to help the refugees who come seeking help uh, safety and protection during times of jihad like I said some people claim this verse abrogated all other peaceful verse that was revealed in Mecca but that's a lie uh, this verse only abrogates the peace treaty which the Meccan tribes who broke with the Meccan tribes who broke it these verses do not abrogate any peaceful verse of the Quran this is an opinion of uh, this is the opinion of uh, classical early scholars like Ibn Abbas, uh, who was the cousin of the Prophet, uh, Mujahim, and Taha. May Allah absolutely bless them. You can read about it in the Tafsir and other books. Now, the terrorist groups claim that the whole world is Darul Harb, which means the territory of war, and they say that we are in obligation to fight non-Muslims and Muslims if they oppose the terror groups. However, according to the Quran and Sunnah, this is complete rubbish because almost every country in the modern world, uh, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, have economic and other peaceful, other forms of peaceful and diplomatic relations with each other. They do not have a relationship of war or Darul Harb. That's nonsense. Especially since World War II, almost the whole world entered into an agreement of peace treaty thanks to the UN Charter. Almost all Muslims current, almost all Muslim countries are a part of this treaty uh, except maybe Palestine but they have a special circumstance when a Muslim country makes a peace treaty with a non-Muslim country it's called Darul Ahad so the UN Charter has become the modern peace treaty between Muslims and non-Muslims so we have to uphold this peace treaty unless a nation breaks this treaty and wage war against the Muslims but even in that situation the fight has to be between two armies and not between civilians and this is very important and, and that's the whole point like that the Quran makes this clear the civilians and non-combatants cannot be harmed so the, the so what the terrorists are doing is not allowed I mean you cannot harm civilians and let me g give you some proofs evidence for that there's a hadith uh, narrated by Raba ibn Rabi who said when we were with the Apostle of Allah Muhammad on an expedition he saw some people collected together over something and sent a man and said see what are these people collected around he then came back and said that they are around a woman who has been killed he said such a woman such a person could not have been involved in fighting now the per uh, the person who was in charge of the battle was Khalid ibn Walid you know uh, he's uh, quite famous you may have heard of him uh, he's uh, considered one of the greatest generals of all time, I think. Uh, anyway, so Khalid ibn Walid was uh, in charge of the van. So he sent a man and said, uh, Prophet Muhammad, he sent a man and said, Tell Khalid to not kill women or hired servants. This is declared authentic by Sheikh Nasser al Din Albani. This is in Sunan Abu Daud, hadith number uh, 2669. Now, now we know that the prophet must be obeyed when it comes to religious rulings. We see this in verse uh, 59:7, which reads, "And whoever and whatsoever the messenger, uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi gives you, take it, and whatever he forbids you, abstain from it." This is in Surah Al Hasr, uh, verse number seven. Uh, now, did ISIS obey the prophet's command on this? Uh, no. The mass graves found in Iraq are a testament to this. They kill whoever they could find, both man and woman. Also, in also Ibn Abbas says the Messenger of Allah, when dispatching his troops, would tell them, "Do not behave treacherously, nor mis misappropriate war booty, nor mutilate those who you kill, nor kill children." nor people in monasteries and this hadith can be, this hadith can be found in Tirmidhi uh, ila al sunan 1231 in another narration the prophet said in a sahih narration do not kill a woman nor a child nor an old age man uh, this is narrated by mufassir bagawi uh, through his isnab which can be found in uh, sara al sunnah uh, 11 11 he said this is an authentic hadith uh, narrated by Muslim now 
is Khariji uh, Khawarij groups like ISIS obeying the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. Because as I just mentioned in this hadith, uh, Prophet Muhammad said that you cannot kill women, children, old men or a priest, you know, religious uh, leaders. Yet, when we look at uh, Khariji groups or terrorist groups, by the way, uh, terrorist groups are in Islamic terms are called Khariji's or Khariji. Uh, Khawarij basically means a rogue group that deviates from the uh, the, Muslim, the entire Muslim Ummah and says that everyone else other than them are kafir or you know uh, disbelievers. Uh, anyways, but I will explain that uh, in detail later. So basically, how the the Khariji groups are not listening to the Prophet is by making attacks on places like the Manchester. Uh, you know, the Ariana Grande concert, where most of the victims were women and children. And one of the victims was Safi Rose Rose, and she was only eight years old. Fucking eight years old. Now, whoever this fucking piece of shit Karji scumbag claimed to follow, it's not the Prophet. The Prophet only fought because he had no other options. And he only fought soldiers. He didn't go to a non Muslim country and start killing fucking kids. The Prophet hated fighting. He told Muslims to do whatever it takes to avoid it. He said in his in this hadith that never wish to meet your enemy, but ask Allah for safety. If you do meet them, be firm and know that paradise lies beneath the shades of sword. This is in Al Bukhari number 3024 and Muslim number 172. So this means that we have to avoid war at all cost. However, if you have no other option but to fight, then you, you're allowed to do it. But are you really going to tell me that the guy who blew himself up in Manchester killing 8-year-old kids had no other options? Really? I mean, you live in the Western country uh, where you have all if options available to you, you know, and you choose to do, do, do the one thing that will kill kids? Really? You couldn't, you couldn't find any other way. This is the thing that people don't understand. Warfare or jihad in Islam is a last resort. When Muslims have no other options, they have their backs against the wall only then. And even then, like only then they're allowed to fight. And even then, and even then, they're not allowed to kill civilians. As I just explained. They can only fight soldiers. So it makes no sense for anyone. Some also the one who will be doing the fighting are soldiers, not civilians. Now this guy, whoever blew himself up, is not a soldier. That's another thing that people often miss. Again, like we have a UN charter, which means means that we have a peace treaty between the Muslim nations and the non-Muslim nations. So this means that the no Peace treaty has been violated by any other country other than the Khariji groups. The most detested of names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are war, harb, and bitterness. Mura. This is in Abu Daud, uh, hadith number 4950. Both Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet hated war. The reason the Prophet had to take up arms is because he had no other choice. And because of the sheer brutality that was shown by the pagans towards the early Muslims was the only reason he had to take up arms because he had no other options. One of the early martyrs of Islam was Sumaya bin Kubat and Yasir. She along with her husband and child had just become Muslims. This is in the early days of Islam when the Prophet just started uh, you know, uh, preaching Islam. The pagans took these new converts, you know, the whole family, I mean the whole family converted. But the pagans didn't like that obviously. So they took them and they started torturing them. Now Sumaya, she was tied up between two camels and they stabbed her with a spear in her female organ. They told her that you embraced Islam for the men and was and she was then obviously lost a lot of blood and she was killed. Her husband Yasser was also killed. Then they get to her, her son and, and these are the two first that were killed because they become Muslims. 
As for Ammar, they forced him to become an ex-Muslim, uh, and they forced uh, him to say that he's not a Muslim anymore. And the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad SAW, uh, was told that Ammar has become an ex-Muslim, or you know, he apostatized. But the Prophet didn't believe them. He said, "Never. Ammar is Ammar is filled with faith from his head to toe." Faith is admixed with his flesh and blood. He would never do this. And then after that, Ammar went to see the Prophet. And he, when he saw the Prophet, he started crying. The Prophet slowly wiped his tears with his own hand and said, If those pagans return to you, tell them what you told me. And let them hear what they want you to, want you to hear. Because if, if, if they know that he's still a Muslim at heart, they'll kill him. Because, like I said, I mean, they were killing anyone who converted to Islam at that time. So this is dangerous, and this is why, uh, if you have, if you have a genuine fear of losing your life, you are allowed to lie in Islam. Now, oftentimes a lot of people confuse this, you know, and say that oh, Muslims are always allowed to lie. No, Muslims are only allowed to lie when they have a fear of losing their life. Other than that, lying is absolutely detested in Islam. And it's actually haram. Now this story can be found in Azbab al-Luzul Wahidi, page number 102. This is why context is important. Uh, they are an extension of Islam. Islamophobes love to mock Muslims when we say religion of peace. Uh, they don't understand why Islam is considered as a religion of peace. It's not because it's hunky-dory and peace all the time. It's because when humanity is at its worst, it advocated peace over violence. This is what we see from the Prophet. He always advocated peace over violence. This is why he made peace treaties with non-Muslims and different pagan tribes to stop the violence. The Khariji groups like, like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, have broken this peace treaty. They attacked and killed people in 9-11. It wasn't the Muslims, it wasn't the Ummah, it was them. No one gave bayah to them, no one supports them. Yet Islamophobes like David Wood is trying to show that they represent the Muslims, the Muslim Ummah. I mean, how dare you? All the death and destruction of Middle East is, for the most part, is their fault. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yes, the Americans in the West and the CIA had a role to play, but there is no excuse. You know, I mean, we Muslims always have this tendency to blame the West for everything. You know, and we need to stop that. Yes, the Western government definitely have a hand in this. Because of their shitty foreign policy, so many people, uh, innocent people are dying. So many of our brothers and sisters are dying, but at the end of the day, the courage, the courage groups like ISIS or Boko Haram still formed under our very noses. Our brothers and sisters chose to join these evil groups. Blaming the Western government is like blaming the shaitan. Yes, because the shaitan, yes, of course, the shaitan influences you to do bad things, but he doesn't force you to do anything. People still choose to do bad things. And the same way, yes, maybe the Western powers do support or somehow create the conditions where Khariji groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda can grow, but they don't force anyone to join these groups. Our, some of our brothers and sisters who have gone astray have chose to join this group because we abandoned our Islamic tradition and wanted to become secular. We stopped giving our kids Islamic education. If they had proper Islamic education, they would know the difference between a Khariji and a Mujahideen. They would know the difference between people who innovate in name of Islam and true Islam. Then the Khariji groups wouldn't be able to brainwash them into joining groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Same with Islamophobes. They wouldn't be able to brainwash people with their lies if people had genuine education of Islamic literature. The Prophet prophesied about these people and said in Al Bukhari 6934 and in Muslim 1068. Uh, this hadith is narrated by Yosir ibn Amr who said, I said to Sahal ibn Hunayf, did you hear the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, say anything about the Kharij? And he said, I heard him say, and he gestured with his hand towards Iraq and said, From there will emerge people who recite the Quran, 
but it will not go past their collarbones. They will pass out of Islam like an arrow passes out of its prey. Hmm. Now, which groups do you think don't understand simple verses, Quranic verses like these that forbids Muslims from doing violence? The Quran, in the Quran, chapter number 2, verse number 190, says, Fight for God's sake those who fight against you, but do not transgress any limit. Also, the Quran forbids us from rebelling against our leaders unless they force us to disobey Allah or takes our or takes away our relig religious freedom. Uh, there's a verse that says, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority among you. This is in Surah Nisa, uh, you know, chapter number 4, verse number 59. Another hadith confirms this. Uh, Ibn Omar reported, The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Listening to and obeying the leader is an obligation upon a Muslim whether he likes it or dislikes it. As long as he is not commanded to disobey Allah, if he is commanded to disobey, then there is no listening or, or, or obedience. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari 2796. Another narration reads, Hudafa ibn al-Yaman reported, The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Rulers after me will come who do not follow my guidance and my tradition, Sunnah. Some of their men will have the hearts of devil in a human body. I said, O Messenger of Allah, what should I do if I live to see that time? The Prophet said, you should listen and obey them. Even if the ruler strikes your back and takes your wealth, even then still listen and obey. This is in Sahih Muslim 1847. Another hadith reads, al ibn Malik reported, The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, The best of your rulers are those uh, whom you love and they love you, who pray for you and you pray for them. The worst of you, the worst of your rulers are those whom you hate and they hate you, whom you curse and they curse you. Then someone said, Shall we confront them uh, with swords? The Prophet said, No, as long as they establish prayer among you. If you find something hateful from them, you should hate their actions, but not withdraw your hand from obedience. This is in Sahih Muslim 1855. Now this next hadith completely shatters the ideology of groups like ISIS, Boko Haram, and the allegations of the Islamophobes that Islam promotes terrorism. Abu Huraira reported, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, whoever rejects obedience to the ruler and divides the community, and dies will have died upon ignorance. Whoever fights under the banner of one who is blind, raging for the sake of tribalism, or calling to tribalism, or supporting tribalism, and is killed will have died upon ignorance. Whoever rebels against my nation, striking the righteous and wicked alike, and sparing not even the believers, and does not fulfill the pledge of security, then he has nothing to do with me and I have nothing to do with them. This is in Sahih Muslim 1848. This proves that if you want to bring change in leadership in a Muslim country, it has to be done via a non-violent means. With this, with things like diplomacy and politics, not by violent means like suicide bombing or terror attack. Those will probably do more harm than good. Now, the question arises, are groups like ISIS or Boko Haram Islamic? The answer is a big fat no. They are not Islamic. They are a courage groups. They are the furthest thing from Islam. They rebel against their own country leaders. They kill both Muslims and non-Muslims. And they are definitely not following the Prophet. Peace, me, peace and blessings be upon him. Now, according to Sheikh Albani, uh, this hadith is classed as Sahih by Albani, in Sahih ibn Majah. The courage are followers of whims and desires and innovations who have deviated from the path of Ahl al Sunnah or Jama'ah. But we do not describe them as disbelievers because of their innovation, un unlike others who follow whims and desire. Now, Funny enough, this prophecy of Prophet Muhammad is very much actualized. You know, the prophecy about him, them coming from Iraq. According to the UN, uh, 
according to an UN study uh, called Journey to Extremism in Africa, it shows that the highest number of people who joined terrorist groups willingly had a rough childhood. They also have little to no Islamic education compared to people who didn't join groups like uh, ISIS or Boko Haram. So based on this data, the more educated you are on Islam or the more educated you are on the Quran, Sunnah, Tafsir or Sirah, the less likely you are to become a terrorist. Because it is much harder to brainwash people who are educated because they can actually challenge the coverage liars and call them out. And this completely shatters this whole idea that the Islamophobes have that the more you, the, the more you have madrasas and uh, universities, Islamic universities, the more likely to you have terrorists. That's that's a complete lie. This research uh, research paper and uh, study completely destroys that whole notion and it proves that uh, the more educated you are on Islam the less likely you are to become a terrorist so another thing that is interesting is that according to the research the people who join terrorist groups are more likely to memorize the Quran without understanding it and this fulfills the prophet's prophecy about people who recite the Quran but it will not go past their collarbones because you know they memorize the Quran but they don't understand it I mean even the leader of ISIS himself Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi who according to some report is only an expert in reading the Quran and not anything else like the Sir Sirah or the Hadith according to American and Iraqi intelligence analysis analyst al-Baghdadi has a doctorate for Islamic studies in Quranic studies from Saddam University in Baghdad. This further shows the accuracy of the prophecy. He re he recite he can recite the Quran, but it doesn't go beyond his collarbone, as the prophet said, uh, as he prophesied that they will recite the Quran, but it will not go beyond the collarbone. And we can see this actualized with Baghdadi because he can he's an expert in reciting the Quran, but he doesn't go beyond his collarbone because he doesn't understand it. He doesn't know the Sirah. He doesn't know the Tafsir. He doesn't know the Sunnah. Or maybe he does, but even when he, he does use the Sunnah or the Hadith or Tafsir, he takes it out of context just like the Quran verses. And in his book, uh, Empire of Fear, writer Andrew Hoskin writes uh, that uh, official education records from Samara High School revealed that Al Baghdadi had to retake his high school certificate in 1991. And he scored uh, 481 out of 600 possible points. A few months later, he was deemed unfit uh, for military service by the Iraqi military due to his uh, nearsightedness. Uh, his high school grades were not good enough for him to study his preferred subjects, you know, law, education, science, and language at the University of Baghdad. So the guy's a loser, <laughs> basically. And now leaving aside the fact that he's a coward, uh, he has no sense of how the world works, no sense of diplomacy, no sense of politics. Why on earth anyone would accept this guy as a leader is beyond me. I mean, forget being a caliph. And as I've proved in this video, he doesn't know anything about the Sunnah or the Prophet. He is no sheikh or, 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 or a scholar. He is definitely not fit to be the leader of Islamic anything. The only thing he is good at is probably leading young people or brainwashing young people to the ways that may lead, to, lead them to the hellfire. And I don't think that's a very good quality for even a fraud pretender like him to have. Because the Prophet said, in Ibn Majah 173 narrated that even Abi Alpha said the Prophet, the Messenger of God, Messenger of Allah SWT, peace and blessings be upon him, said the courage are the dogs of hell. I mean think about it. These people are reciting the Quran without understanding it. What it means you know, I mean, they recite the Quran, but they don't understand what it means.
The same is true for the Islamophobes as well. I mean, many of their audience, to my experience, are uneducated on Islam. So it's easier to brainwash them. This is why Islamophobes like David Wood are dangerous because they are taking advantage of people's lack of knowledge and lying to them to spread their propaganda the same way ISIS and Boko Haram does. So in the end of the day, stay away from ISIS and Boko Haram and stay away from people like David Wood. They are the same thing basically. <laughs> you know, they are both lying to you. Now in response to David Wood, David Wood, let's take a look at a peaceful verse from the Bible about the prophet David. You know, the guy Mr. Wood was probably named after. Now, David was a prophet in the Bible and we know that he was a prophet because we find this in, in a verse of the Bible in the New Testament. This is in Acts uh, 2.29-30 which reads, Brothers, I can tell you with confidence that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God would have promised him an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Now, let's see what example the Bible is teaching us with this prophet. Now, this is uh, in 1 Samuel, which reads, Why David arose and went, he and his men, he and his men, and slew the Philistines, 200 men. And David brought their foreskin, okay, and they gave them in full tale to the king, and that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him um, Michal, uh, his daughter, uh, to wife. Now, according to Bible scholar Matthew Henry, who in his commentary writes, if David magnified the honor of being son-in-law to King Saul, how should we magnify the honor of being sons to the king of kings? So basically, this Bible verse is telling us that this prophet, you know, this prophet of God, he, in order to marry some girl, he, because he wanted to impress his father-in-law, he went and killed 200 men, skinned them, their dead bodies, brought those skin, to the king uh, and impressed him and then married his daughter. Just think about that for a second. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're accusing the prophet and the Quran be of being violent. And here we have beautiful gems like this. You know, just let that sink in for a moment. Okay. Now, and this uh, Bible scholar, uh, Matthew Henry, who lived, I believe, in the six, uh, 16th century, oh, sorry, uh, 1600, uh, he's actually justifying it. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, sure, let's ignore the whole David skinning Philistines just to get the girl part, you know, and justify it by shifting the attention to the father. Uh, let's also not forget the obvious red herring here. So, Mr. David, you know, if, if you ever want to impress your father, father-in-law, don't forget to bring some fresh human skin, <laughs> you know, as the Bible teaches. Uh, now let's see what Prophet Muhammad also has to say on how to deal with enemies in the battlefield. Do not behave treacherously, nor misappropriate war property, nor mutilate dead bodies. This is in Timidi, Ilal Sunan, 12.31. Now ask yourself, which one is the better teaching? Skinning your enemies just to get a girl or showing respect to your fallen enemies by not mutilating them in a justified war? I'm not going to tell you uh, which teaching is better. Just think about it first, uh, for yourself. I think it's quite obvious. By the way, I don't believe the Bible to be historically accurate. 100% I'm only comparing the teachings of Islam and Christianity oh and since uh, Mr. David Wood loves taking the Quran out of context 
Let's see what it looks like when he's taken out of context. Enjoy. I'm married to my hammer. I love my hammer. I rape my hammer. And women, rape them all you want. I couldn't conceivably care less than because I love my hammer. And with that, I will end the video. Zazakallahu uh, khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We'll probably see you guys in the next one. So take care. Bye.